So today, we are taking a break from a series that we have been doing. The series is called Happy Book, in which we've been taking a look at how can you be happy, actually more than happy. So <clears throat> you missed that, newbranch.net's our website. Go back and listen to last week's message. But today, we have a big announcement, and so we're going to take a break in the series and then come back to that series next week and tell you more about how you can be happy. In fact, even more than that, how you can have joy in your life. Today, though, we're gonna, we have a, a big announcement, okay? <laughs> and, we, and I'm super excited about it, and I hope that you will be as well. But I do believe that it requires a little bit of prep before I just come out and say, hey, here's what we want to do, and this is what we believe God is leading us to, and, uh, and I can't wait to say that. But here's what I know. I think there's something that comes a little bit before, even for myself, that's some, something that God has been showing me in my life, and I want to share it with you. And it has to do with the number one question that people ask me as a pastor, and it's this. How can I know what God is saying? How can I know what God's will is for my life? Have you ever asked that? Have you ever wondered, how can you make decisions? Now, some of that we've looked at as a church, and, and it's a little bit the same in the sense of, or as an individual, that we've looked at it to go, hey, how can we pray and really hear from God. And so we had a series called Seven Habits of, uh, of a Follower of Jesus at the first of the year where we talked about how to pray. And some of this is the same, but now we're talking about how can we do that as a church? And to be honest with you, there's a piece that we can't do alone that God made us to need each other. That's what the word church means. It means the collection of, of the people that are following Jesus that we need each other. And there's something that only comes together when we come together. But how do we make a decision? Is it just, hey, I feel this way, you feel that way, we'll take a poll? <laughs> you ever been part of that kind of stuff? We'll just do focus groups and see what everybody really wants and go that way? Or is there a way to actually hear what God is calling us to do? And so what I want to do is I want to share what I believe is a pattern that's found all throughout the Bible that you can come back to again and again and again when you're considering what is God saying? How can I actually hear from God? And so I want to show you this pattern. It's found in Acts chapter 4. It lays it out very clearly. But before we go to Acts chapter 4, what I wanted to do was I simply wanted to kind of review what led up to Acts chapter 4. So what came before Acts chapter 4 was Acts chapter 3, okay? <laughs> And what came before that was Acts chapter 2. Okay, so I'm just playing. So let me tell you what happened in Acts chapter 2, and that might help a little bit. Actually, even before that. So, so when a person reads the Bible, they always ask, where should I start? Because some people get very confused. They start reading the Bible, and it gets a little confusing. And my suggestion would be is, is start with the New Testament, because it gets you right into the main part and the main theme of the Bible. So if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, either one of them, because there's four Gospels that tell the same story from a little bit different angles. You can pick any of them. I prefer John, because my name is John, and I just, anyway. <laughs> anyway, whatever. But it tells you the story that God sent his one and only son to the world to restore a relationship with God, that Jesus Christ came, God's one and only son, lived the perfect life, died on the cross for the sins of the world, and rose from the dead. That's, that's called the gospel. That's called the good news. That's really what the Bible's all about. In fact, everything from the Old Testament was to lead us up to that pivotal moment. And so that's really what the Bible's all about. So I've, I've basically just given you the entire Bible in a nutshell. And so when you read at the end of the gospel accounts, what you'll see is, is that Jesus Christ died, and then when he rose from the dead, he spent 40 days on the earth showing everybody, hey, I'm alive, and he gave some final instructions on what his disciples were to do. Because he spent time before his death, spending three and a half years with some selected men that said, hey, when, after I die, and after I rise from the dead, I need you guys to share that good news. And it's going to be done through something called the church. And they had no idea what that meant at the time. But he, but he invested in them, and he did life with them, and he showed them so that they would know everything they needed to do to start the church. And then after his death and burial and resurrection, he spent 40 days, and he walked around, and he showed himself, and he did everything. And then he went up on the Mount of Olives, and he said, hey, now I'm leaving it with you. And he basically, from the Mount of Olives, he ascended back into heaven, which means basically he floated off the Mount of Olives and disappeared. And, and we know from the book of Hebrews that it says, and then he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, where he makes intercession for us. While we're learning about him, while 
He's praying that we come into relationship with him and even for our lives. That's, that's what the Bible teaches. Now, the book of Acts picks up from there. After he ascends, what happens? And maybe you've never read it, and so I just wanted you to know what happens. And so he said, hey, when after this, what I want you to do is go and spread the gospel. And after he went into the clouds, guess what happened? The angel came down and said, hey, stop looking up in the clouds. Go spread the gospel. Go share the good news. But that's not the full thing that was said. And this is why a lot of people don't have the power of God because it didn't say go out and share the gospel right now. Maybe you didn't see that part. This is very important. There's something that came before that. What he said was, go wait until I send the comforter. Go wait until I send the power. And, and the way I would put that is this, is have you ever woke up on Christmas morning and you got a new brand new toy, but batteries weren't included? Anybody? <laughs> You ever done that with your kid and go, I got the best toy in the world, and you wrapped it up, not thinking about it. They pull it out Christmas morning, and this amazing thing doesn't work, right? Because it has what? It has no power. Can I tell you, the same thing is true here, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for the sins of the world, and he rose from the dead, and he said, hey, I need to give you some instructions, you, if you think that you talking is what shares the gospel, you couldn't be more wrong. Because it's not intellectual. You need the power of God to do that. And the problem with some of us are, we've never actually heard from God, right? Because I, believe me, I've talked to a lot of people. They, they go, no, I, I really don't know what God's saying. How would you know what God is saying? And I can help you with something. <clears throat> you have to have the power of God in order to hear from God. Does that make sense? And so, so what we're saying is, is that that's what they waited for. And so it says in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, that they gathered together, much like we're in a room like today, almost the same amount of people were in that room. In fact, met Mary, the mother of Jesus, was in that room. And they waited for 10 days. That's a long time, isn't it? What did they do during that time? He said to go spread the gospel. Yeah, he did. But he said, first wait. He made them wait 10 days. And what did they do? They prayed. And they prayed, and they prayed until the power of God came to them. You know what the power of God was? It was the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but most of the time when I thought about the Holy Spirit, I used to think of him like this. I used to think, like, I watched Star Wars, so I thought, may the force be with you. I used to think, may the Holy Spirit be with you. I thought that. That's a bad analogy, really is. Because the Holy Spirit is a person. The father, God says he is one, right? Even in the Old Testament, he, the, the number one thing about being Jewish or being an Israelite was this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Wait a minute, you're saying, well, wait a minute, you said there's three gods, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. No, I said that there's one God, but he has three persons. He's, had, he's <clears throat> let us know that he has three persons, but he is one God. It's very confusing, but that's who he is. And he said, the, the persons of the Godhead are the Father. We understand him as being a person. He has personhood. We understand Jesus. We saw him, right? So he's a person. But where it breaks down for a lot of us is the Holy Spirit. We've never thought of him as a person, and that's why we don't know how to interact with him. Interact with him just like you would a person. And he says, you wait, and I will send the person of God, the Holy Spirit. And as he fills you, you will have the power to do it. If you go without him, guess what you have? no power. And that's what's missing in a lot of our lives. I just wanted to clear that up because I have a feeling that's what a lot of people are thinking. And before we go to what we want to talk about today, we can't go there until we understand this or we won't be going together like they did. And it says that they gathered in the upper room in Acts chapter 2. After Acts chapter 1, guess what comes? Acts chapter 2. And in Acts chapter 2, after 10 days, they prayed, right? And it says when they prayed in unity, the word is actually harmonics. It means when they're in tune, right? As they come together, then what? The place where they were meeting was shaken. That's basically what it says in Acts chapter 2. Oh, I thought you said Acts chapter 4. No, Acts chapter 2. It says that it was almost like an earthquake and tongues of fire came down on top of them, right? But that's basically what it means. And then they were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. But there's a part that a lot of people don't see. It's like, well, that's awesome. But here's the part that's important. Then... 
they went out and they preached the word of God. And they had power, right? Because 3,000 people got saved and baptized that first day of the church. And then a, a dynamic broke out that was absolutely incredible where they had community together and they served and they loved each other and they did this amazing dynamic that's found in Acts chapter 2. So if you've never read that and you want to know what church should be like, it should be like what happened in Acts chapter 2. It was a movement of God. It wasn't just an organization. It wasn't just a brand. It wasn't just a program. It was people that were doing life together. And it was a little bit messy, to be quite honest. If you start something instantly with 3,000 people, that's pretty crazy, isn't it? Acts chapter 3, the apostles started to do more and more miracles, both healing people physically and emotionally and spiritually. It was absolutely incredible. By Acts chapter 4, they were over 5,000 people. They only counted the men back then, so... We count everybody now. Um, but they only counted men, so it really meant, hey, with women and children, they were probably more like 10,000 people by Acts chapter 4. And then the Sanhedrin, or the, the ruling religious-type people in their day, because they were both one and the same, they, they really didn't know God, but they didn't really want anybody else to either. It's kind of like, hey, anything religious has to come through us. They basically called them in and were like, we got to put a stop to this because they're starting to really grow. I mean, this thing is like a movement. And so they brought them in and they said, knock it off, right? But they were kind of scared. The Sanhedrin was a little scared of the people because they had done miracles. So the people were all for them. They were all for this, this Jesus thing. And they said, knock it off. Knock it off. Stop, stop saying that. And they said, we won't. And at the end of it, they actually threatened them. They said, knock it off or we'll hurt you. And then they let them go. They, they didn't intend to stop spreading the gospel. But after that encounter, they came back together as the whole church. They brought the church in just like they did at the beginning, just like they did in the upper room. They saw this as a pattern. Whenever they needed to hear from God, whenever they needed to come together and really hear from God to say, hey, they threatened us, what should we do? You know what they did? They came together in prayer, in unity. And, and let me show you the pattern. After they prayed, this is Acts chapter 4, verse 31. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. Sounds exactly like Acts chapter 2, believe me. And, and after they were shaken, they were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And then what did they do? They spoke the word of God boldly. And the church doubled in size again. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? You know why? Because they had the power of God. They understood something. They understood that the power they went in wasn't those people. It was th when we all listened to God, so they, they came together and did that. Now, we see the same pattern, I want you to know, from Jesus himself. This is exactly what he prayed about before going to the cross. He actually saw this and prayed for it. John chapter 17, if you want to write it down. John 17, Jesus is about to go to the cross, and in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prays this. He says, Father... Make them one. He's talking about his disciples. He said, Father, make them one just as you are in me and I am in you. Did, did I tell you about God? There is nothing more one than the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But he said, make them one just like we are. Make them united. He realized that's the key. The key to being filled by the Spirit isn't uniformity, it's unity. As we come together in harmonics, to hear the voice of God. And when you do, he said, he said something else would happen. He said, make them one just as you are in me and I am in you so that the world may know that you have sent me. Some people stop there. It's about mission. He's saying when they hear from God and are empowered, they don't sit on that for themselves. It's actually so that they can reach more people for the cause of Jesus Christ. And that's what Jesus prayed, not only for them, he actually said, I pray for those that come after them. That was his prayer for us. He prayed for you. He prayed for me. He prayed that we would become that. And that's the pattern that we see. So I simply want to just write it, I want you to give you the pattern so that you can write this down. We can apply that to what we're going to talk about today. But you can also pull this out any time that you want to see, how do I hear from God? Because believe me when I tell you, that it may seem like, oh man, that's really common sense. But believe me, in this case, common sense isn't always common practice. It's not even for pastors. So I want to just give you the pattern that I see. Four things, okay? Four things. 
how to hear from God. Number one, come together in prayer. Now, that sounds simple, doesn't it? But i got to be honest, even as a pastor, the first thing we want to do is, well, we're going to do this, and we're going to do this, and we're going to say this. And the way I see it is, right? <laughs> Anybody do that? <laughs> I do, right? That's, that's not bad. I mean, God made us that way to go, hey, we have a brain. But he's saying, before you make a decision, if you really want to know if God is in it, it isn't what you think, it's have you come together in prayer. Okay, that's the first. Second, let God change you. Well, where do you see that? It says that he shook them, right? He shook the place. It, you pray until God shakes you, okay? It, you, you know how I know when God's shaking you? Because it's not going to be anything that you thought of, right? <laughs> Anybody ever had that? We said that when it applies to ourselves. If you go back to the beginning of the year, that's exactly what we said. We're like, hey, it doesn't make sense in my mind, so where did this thought come from? And we can weigh that out, and that's why it's important that we come together. So it's not just like, hey, I'm having crazy thoughts, and I think that's from God. It's going, hey, as we come together, we're going, man, God is doing something amazing. As we allow him to change our thoughts, not leaning hard into self, leaning hard into God. So number one, come together in prayer. Number two, let God change you. Number three, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Why am I saying that? Not filled with self, filled with the Spirit. That's as spooky as we'll get with it. And and the reason why I'm saying that is is because so many people are like, oh, there's this whole thing about the Holy Spirit and we're scared of it and and, and, and because we've seen some weird stuff that people do when when they claim that that's the Holy Spirit. It's not weird. What we're simply saying is this, is that the power of God comes as we yield ourselves to him. We see it in Ephesians. He says, don't be drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. Any, anybody need an explanation on that? <laughs> I made a mistake of asking, how many people have ever been drunk? <laughs> okay, let's not do that again today. <laughs> I thought it was funny. And a majority raised their hand. Okay, <laughs> we, we got you. So we understand why not to be drunk with wine. He says, but instead, be filled with the Spirit. It doesn't mean like intoxication. It means to be, it means to yield soberly the controls of your life to him. It's not like he's forcing himself on you. He's saying, you have a choice. You can lean hard into you, or you can lean hard into how God does it. But you can't have both. You you can't hold on to your way or the world way of doing it and lean into God. That's why it's changing, right? And, And here's the question is, how's it? How's what you're doing been working for you, right? Because so many people go, I want God to change me, but I don't plan on changing anything. Oh, I, I, don't, I don't change how I live. I don't change how I behave. I don't change according to what God says, and you think that he's going to fill you. <laughs> and people come to me like that, and they give me their opinion, and I go, that's great. I just don't think it's from God. You might wonder how I know that. Well, because how could you hear from God when you're drunk with wine, right? How can you hear from God when you're living debauch? Now, I'm not saying that he can't work through that. I'm simply saying as we yield ourselves to him, then what happens? We let him change us, and then we're filled with his power, and then we know what he's saying. Does that make sense? If we come together as a church, so powerful. And then what? There's one last piece to hearing from God that sometimes it's left off, and this is why our life is not blessed. If it's only us experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit, believe me, what you're going to get, and we're talking about the joy book in this series that that we've been in, and we're pausing today, part of it is this, is when you yield yourself to him, you will have peace like you have never had. You will experience joy like you have never had. But there's another step that's even more, and that is to take action on what God is saying. And here's my thing as a pastor. Only what God is saying. Not what John says, what God says. Not what you say, what God says. Not what a small group of people says. Not even if there's a a majority of people that say. It's what God says. But here's the beauty of Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 15, in Acts chapter 39, where we see they came together, the harmonics of it says this. If you're hearing God's voice and I'm hearing God's voice, we're all hearing the same voice. Isn't that something? 
That's how you make a decision. That's how you move forward. So that's simply what I wanted to share with you about how to make decisions in your life is come together, let God change you, be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, and then do what God says. And that's what I want us to do here today. I simply wanted to lay that out because I have a feeling there's some people that have never heard that and you're wondering why you've never heard from God and you're going to find out just like I did as we do that, it's one of the most powerful, amazing things that will ever happen in your whole life, okay? So now I want to get practical. I got something big I want to tell you about, and I want to do it my way today. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> and simply just give you a story, because that's how I kind of feel, okay? It's a dialogue. So I want to just share a story with you guys, and then I want us to apply this, okay? So I'm going to sit down so I don't get too excited. Okay. <laughs> so story time with John. How's that? <laughs> so about three years ago, I feel like I feel like I, I saw something, and, and I want to tell you what that was. So three years ago, I went to a um, I went to a conference. It was actually a training for church planters, and it was from one of the largest church planting organizations in the world called ARC, called Associated Related Churches, that we've been part of and we help support. And they flew us down there to get some training so that we can help some other pastors. So I wasn't planting a church because we've already done it. But then we went down there to see, hey, here's all the things you could have done that you could have done better, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> and it was like, man, I wish we had known that then. But, um, but it was really awesome. It was awesome training. And I met a lot of pastors. They had 100 pastors going through the training that were going to be planting churches all over the country. And while I was there, it, it felt like by coincidence, but I don't think it was, I met a guy by the name of Eric Dingler. And, um, and I was in the hallway, and him and his wife were out there, and I just said, hey, where are you guys planting a church? And he said, um, in Virginia Beach. And I was like, oh, wow, you know, um, that's pretty close to where I'm at. I'm out in the country. <laughs> um, and he had not heard of Windsor. He definitely hadn't heard of Zuni. So anyway, uh, <laughs> but he had heard of Norfolk. Okay, so anyway, um, and I said, a little bit further out west than Norfolk. Um, and, and so when he came, I said, hey, why don't you come eat you know, breakfast with me one morning? And so I took him to Farmer's Daughter, and that was kind of fun. And um, he said, what would you recommend? I said, the pancakes. And, uh, and so he said, well, I'm really hungry. Should I get one or two? <laughs> and I said, definitely two. Um, <laughs> and people that have been to Farmer's Daughter, you, you're laughing because the, the pancakes there are about the size of this, this right here. So he got two, and he's like, whoa, you know. <laughs> he's like, my whole family ate off of that later that day, you know, so it was kind of funny. And, uh, and so we had a good conversation, and, and, then, and then we left. And, and, and then what, what happened that same week was, I got a call from a church that's right down the road from us. They're about five minutes from us. If you were to go out here, and if, when you get to Dairy Queen, if you were to turn right on the 258 heading towards Franklin, they're about five minutes down 258, and their church is called, it was called Mount Carmel. And um, we had a relationship with them and the pastor there and stuff. But anyway, their pastor had left, and they were just looking for somebody to fill the pulpit. And so I was like, um, yeah, I can recommend a few guys, but um, I met this guy at the art conference, never heard him preach, so don't have any clue. He might be horrible. <laughs> Uh, but I don't think so because Ark has approved him, so he's probably pretty good, and he seemed good and stuff. And, um, and so he went out there and preached for him one Sunday. And he actually came to our church before that, and so he came to our first service and then went and preached at Mount Carmel. And I actually asked him to come in here and mystery shop us to go, hey, see how we're doing. So he gave us some feedback. You want to hear some of the feedback he gave? No, I'm just playing. It was really good feedback, and he, he really loved our church, and he gave us a couple of pointers that say, hey, here's some things you could do better, and um, we actually changed some of those things. It was pretty awesome. And then he went out there and preached, and they liked him enough that they said, hey, Eric, why don't you come here and, and, and pastor here? You know, like, instead of planting a church, why don't you do that? And he's like, ah, no, I don't, I don't think that's what God, you know, I think, I think I'm really, I should be planting a church in Virginia Beach. And so, they, so they, made, they made an agreement to say, hey, maybe he would preach for them for a period of time to help him out. And so they did. And through that, they started to pray. And it was a pretty amazing thing that happened there, which was a church that was probably 196 years old made a decision to say, hey, what if we, what if we shut down and relaunched under your church plant? And that, that's exactly what they did, which was pretty unheard of. I've lived out here <clears throat> most of my life. I know a lot of the churches, so, so it's very unheard of to see a church do that. But they wanted to make some changes, and they believed in what was happening. And so that's why they became Coastal City Church. So just to be clear, he didn't plant a church in Virginia Beach. He came out here, and he helped revitalize the church. And basically, it was like a church plant because they were probably about 20 people at that time. 
And since then, over the last couple of years, they've kind of built up and they have one service, but they've built it up to, you know, 75 plus people. And it's been really, really super awesome. And they've had services above that, way over 100 people and stuff like that. And so it's been a really amazing experience. And the people are super excited about what's going on. They're reaching people. And um, we've done some partnerships with them. And they asked me early on to be an advisor in the, or a, an overseer in their church, which is basically like a pastor that provides some oversight and accountability for their pastor, and they can ask me advice and things like that. Um, and so that worked out pretty good. And then after about, a, after about a year of him doing that, I saw something that I felt like God laid on my heart. And so I, I went to Eric, and I said, Eric, I've been praying about this, and, and there's something that I see th that I just want us to consider. I said, I've never considered anything like this before, so <laughs> this might be from God because I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have even thought of this. I said, what if... We're so similar in what we're doing in the same small area. I was like, you know, <laughs> you have the same vision that we do. And the reason why I know that is is because when you came, you said, hey, can I use your vision statement? <laughs> and we said, sure, you can use our vision statement. So it's the same. And then you reworded it, and, it, and you reworded it because you're a better wordsmith than me. And, um, and so now we use your vision statement, and you said we could. So, so we have the same vision, honestly, same vision and mission and all of that. But... But culturally, we're very the same. Well, how we do church, how our people respond, not, not ethnically, we're all ethnically diverse and stuff like that, but culturally, we're very similar in how we do things and how we see ministry and, and even you know, how we're reaching people and relationships and stuff like that. And we've done several events together and stuff like that. And I said, what if we, what if we combined efforts? And he said, oh man, I'm really open to that. He said, but I think it's too soon for our church. And I said, yeah, I, I agree. So we kind of tabled it, and we kind of we wrote it off for a while. But every time we got together, either one or the other of us would joke. You know, like I went out there, and we, we helped him find a contractor that could renovate his auditorium, and they did an excellent job. I think some people are here that helped with that project. It was absolutely awesome. And what they did was they raised the floor and pulled out their pews so they could put in chairs. In fact, their chairs are more comfortable than ours. Anyway, you can preach longer. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> and so... <laughs> That was a joke. <laughs> and, uh, and so they, they leveled the floor so they could use it for act activities and stuff like that. And they put in a brand new sound system. And we went, hey, man, that's exactly the sound system that we would want to get. It's digital and all this kind of stuff, but it was very expensive. And so we're like, hey, wow, that's awesome. And then when we hired a music minister, he was kind of like, oh, man, we wish we could. I mean, if we were together, we could be doing these things, you know. And there were just several things like that that every time we get together, we'd be like, man, if we were together, we could, you know, and, uh, and joking around. And then we did some events together. We did a, a big thing out in Franklin where we helped the community, and we came together and partnered, and our people got along really well together. And then we did a fishing trip this past summer together, and it was really fun. And, um, and so anyway, we've done a lot of things like that, and we just kind of tabled it. Anything we can do to help them. I think they've used our baptistry and stuff like that. And so just a lot of things like that that we've, we, we do together. But over the last little bit, I, I just really believe that God kind of pressed me again about it. And so I called Eric back up and I said, Eric, I, I just want to revisit it. I mean, if you don't think this is good, we'll just, you know, stop right now. And he said, no, I, honestly, I think the timing is right this time. <laughs> and I really can see a vision for that because of some of the things we want to be able to accomplish in the future that we could really do more together than apart. And so we said, hey, let's pray about it together, but let's bring in our, our closest advisor, which is our board, and bring them in so they can pray about it and actually speak into it, because they may see things that we don't, because I have a lot of crazy ideas. And so, so they, we, our board started to pray about it, and we, we brought our families together. Our board said, hey, we, we actually think that has some validity. We'd like to pray on it sometime. And so we decided, hey, we'll bring our, our wives and, and our kids together. Um, I have a 21-year-old, and he has... Um, kids that are in elementary school, so it's a little different, but um, just to see how, you know, what do our wives think? Because they're much smarter than we are, and um, we both married up, so it's like, hey, we brought them in to say, hey, what do you think? And, um, and so we talked about theology, we talked about anything that we thought could possibly be differences, and we left there going, wow, this could be really incredible. And um, our boards liked it, and so we brought the two boards together, and they prayed about it, and they, they, they came together, and they, they were like, it feels like th this is really an awesome thing. And then after that, we, um, we brought in our ministry leads, and we said, hey, before we approach our congregation, we would like to make sure that, what, what do you guys, what do, what do you guys think? You know, like, like, I want you to pray about it, and we brought them together, and they asked questions, and, and they were all in agreement, and so that's kind of why we're coming here today, is to say, we really believe that God is leading us to merge our churches together, that we really believe we could do more together than apart, 
And um, we think there are some long-term wins, um, and I think they're probably the more important ones, that in, a, in an area our size, we believe it would be served better by one highly functional church than two churches doing the exact same thing in the exact same place. And we'll be able to help some other churches, which has always been a long-term goal for us to say, hey, how can we help plant churches, revitalize churches, add, you know, um, campuses and things like that. And we think we could get there faster. So what I want to do is, is I simply want to say what it would actually mean to us, because I know it's going to take some time to absorb what it is that we believe that God is leading us to do. Um, in, in the short term, one of the wins would be this, is we, we think that moving from our facility to theirs would be a win because our facility is rented and we pay <clears throat> several thousand dollars a month to rent here, plus we pay the taxes because we don't own the building so we can't be tax exempt as a church on property that's not ours. And so we pay a lot more money. So to being a good steward, we feel like that church could, could house, it's, it's about the same size as we have, and they only have one service. So by the time we put our people together, we feel like we could house it under one service. And just by, for some of us from Windsor driving five more minutes, because that's how long it takes to get from here to Coastal City Church that's in Walters, um, it would take five minutes to get there. We would save several thousand dollars a month, and we think that would be a better stewardship of our money. Um, a lot of people have asked, what would that do to our land? And the answer to me is, is that it would get us that much closer to being able to use our land because we would have two more functioning congregations with more leadership and two full-time pastors um, that can, that, that what we've decided is, is that we would share responsibilities to say where he's really gifted at, that's the ministries that would fall under him, and where I'm really gifted at, those ministries would fall under me, and then we would share responsibilities preaching, which would actually open us up to being able to focus on so much more in the church and being able to even focus on some things outside the church that we see would be a benefit. So there's a lot of things to think about as it comes, and so there's a lot of excitement for us but I also realize that it might take some time to absorb that for the rest of us. Um, and you may be, like some people have been like, hey man, I think I'm, I'm, I'm on board right away. Some people, it might take you some time. Some people might be on board right away and then some questions will come. And so what we would like to do is, we would like to give you some time to do this. That we don't want to go, hey, let's hurry up and just push everybody together. But what we're thinking is this, is that on January the 5th, we would like to go meet on a Sunday night where we can share vision after we've met with our ministry leads and figure out, hey, how could we do this and what would ministry look like there and how would our people marry up with their people and be able to do ministry? And we could actually show, hey, here's where we think we could go. And so we would have a vision night on January 5th. We haven't picked the time yet, but you'll hear about that. But between now and January 5th, what I'd like to ask you to do is pray. Not just respond although I know that's kind of the first inclination that most of us would have. I have an opinion, and I want to share it, and I'm good with that. You can share your opinion. But I'd like you to more say, what is God saying to you? And if you've never done this, then this would be a perfect opportunity to say, hey, you have a very vested interest here. We've been here nine years. That's a lot of change. Um, but, but would you pray about where God is leading us to? Could we do more together than apart? And here's what I think. If we come together and we pray, and we let God change us, not just leaning hard into self, and we're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, and here's my answer to you, then do whatever God says. And if you hear from God, and there's a real reason why we shouldn't do this, I don't care how far we are in the process, we don't want to go unless God goes with us. Does that make sense? But we're not here to take focus groups or polls. Every example of that in the Bible was hideous. When they voted about going into the promised land, can I tell you how badly that went for them? <laughs> Read in the book of Exodus, you'll find out, right? Read in the book of Numbers, you'll find out they decided they didn't want to go. And it didn't work out good. God said, okay, march around the wilderness for 40 years. Then they decided they did want to go, and God wasn't with them, and they got destroyed. So what I'm asking is this. But I also believe this, and some of you guys have seen this. I don't want it just to be what John said. Because while I lead the church and while I have a voice and I hope that's a good thing and, I, and I, don't, I don't diminish leadership at all, it isn't just because John said. It's because we believe that God is leading us there. And what I want you to do is, is I want you to take some time between now and January 5th and pray and say, what is God saying? 
And if he fills you, I believe we're going to hear, and if we hear the same voice, then I believe God will lead us in a direction that will change not only us, but the world for him. So that's what I'm going to ask you to do. Now, there's one other thing, and I think this comes from a place. I'm getting a lot, some gray hair, so I think I can say this, from a place of maturity. It's something that God's been showing me, so this is not condescending. This is something that I believe God has poked me with, and I want to share it with you because I believe it may help you, some of us, maybe all of us from time to time, and it's this. I think I always get really excited about big picture goals, which is super awesome, but one thing I've learned the hard way is this, is that the devil is in the details. You believe that? It really is. It devil is in the fine print. The devil is in how are we going to do all this and what is going to happen, and then he's actually in more. There's another place that he finds himself, and I think this is a detail. The devil is in our insecurities. That's what I see the most. That sometimes when things start to go and we go, hey, there's an excitement, sometimes we feel like we're going to retract back a little bit. Sometimes we retract back because it's not a good thing. I get that. And we want to be able to share that. We don't want to be able to suppress how we feel. But sometimes it's an insecure thing. It's like, what does it mean for me? And there's fear. And believe me, as a pastor, you have all kinds of fears. You know, what will happen to me? What will happen to my family? And I believe God showed me something to say this. Don't, don't worry so much how. Worry about who. Does that make sense? Don't worry about so much why. Worry about who. Who said it? Right? If you need some examples of that, you look back through the gospel accounts, and what you're going to find is you're going to find story after story where Jesus came to his disciples, and they went, how are we going to feed 5,000 people? And Jesus said, how can we feed 5,000 people with two pieces of bread and five fish? How is that possible? And Jesus said, because you're focused on how, not who, right? You're focused on your why. I got you. But I don't need human wisdom. I need God's wisdom. That's why I say pray this way. What am I talking about with insecurity? That sometimes that Satan will love to get in and where the unity will break up is in our own insecurities. And I've seen it in my own personal life. And it's held me back from doing things that God's called me to do. What's going to mean to me? Will people leave me out? And now that they have this, what will happen to me? And the story that's helped me the most in my life, I just want to share with you, Luke chapter 15. It's one of the most important passages, I believe, for our church because it's where God, where Jesus really clearly teaches how God sees us. But the point of the story isn't everything that we've pulled out of it. It's actually the end of the story of Luke 15. That's the main point. And I think it's, I think it's one that could help us today. The story is this, is that Jesus had came to speak to some people that were very diverse. And most of them were sinners and tax collectors, and a few of them were religious rulers. And the religious rulers were basically saying, why would you talk to these guys? But what was behind that question wasn't that, it's why don't you care about me? Because if you care about them, you must not care about me. That's insecurity. And Jesus saw it, and so he told a story, and he said, here's how God sees you. And he started saying, hey, wouldn't you leave 99 sheep to go after the one lost sheep? Wouldn't you leave you know, your money at home and go find the one lost coin? And then he gave another story where he said, hey, it's like this. A father had two sons, and the youngest son said, hey, give me my inheritance now. And, and the young son went out and squandered his money on wild living and prostitutes and all kinds of things like that. And then the son, after he squandered all the money, (laughs) he ended up having to get a job, but he had no skills, so he ended up in a pig pen. (laughs) And then he said, my father's servants live better than me. Why don't I go home? And then when I go home, my father will will allow me to be a servant, and I'll live better than I do now. And so as he comes home, he's working up this speech to apologize to his father, and the father meets him on the road, and he runs out to him, and and he puts sandals on his feet and a ring on his finger, and, and he says, kill the fatted calf. My son has come home. And God is saying, that's how God sees us. He wants to restore a relationship. He's not against us, he's for us. And when we come humbly back to God, he will restore us. But that's not the main part of the story. The main part of the story is the last part. This is is how he ends it. He says, and then, as they're celebrating this son that returned, right, the older brother comes home. And he's fine until he hears, hey, who are they celebrating? And they say, your brother, my brother. 
And his insecurities start to take over. And what happens? When he sees the Father, he lashes out. It's a picture of us lashing out at God, quite honestly. Why did you do that? How could you do that for him? Why are you celebrating him? And what we're really asking is this. He finally got down to it. You haven't even given me a goat. You've never done anything for me. You read Luke chapter 15. It's amazing. It's showing all of his insecurities. And the father didn't get mad. You know what he did? He came to the son in his insecurity, and he put his hand on his son's shoulder, and he, and he showed him a vision. He said, everything I have is yours. It always has been. I'm right beside you. Don't let your insecurities make you miss the mission of God. He's giving him a pause. He's saying, everything I have is yours. But here's the thing, son. I'm always with you. I haven't held anything back from you. Because I love him doesn't mean I don't love you. And at the end of it, you know what he says? But we had to be glad and celebrate because this brother of yours was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and now he's found. That's the thing that our church is built on. But here's what I know. After nine years, as we start to make changes, that Satan would like nothing better than to get into the insecurities that we have in our lives and say, hey, what does that mean for me? And what is going to happen to me? And what's going to happen to the way I like it? And what's going to happen to this? And what I'm telling you is this, is that I believe that God is coming alongside, not me, God is coming alongside and he's saying, hey, don't worry. If I'm here, you're going to be all right. Get it? Allow him to do a work. How do you do that? You come together and we pray. We come together and we let God change us. Believe me, this is, this is something for me too. If you don't think pastors are insecure people, then you don't know many of them, <laughs> if not all of them. But I believe that we can move forward together in something that is almost unheard of because it will take humility for all of us to do more for the kingdom of God than for our own kingdom, if that makes sense. And we come together and we pray and we let God change us and we're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And then here's the thing. The only thing I'm asking you to do is just do what God tells you. And that's it. So here's what I want to do today. If you got questions, please come see us, talk to us, talk to our leaders. We want to entertain all of them. But I want us to start by praying. And so I've asked Carol Owens, I'm pulling out the biggest gun that I have, okay? <laughs> She's a mother in the faith to me. And believe me when I tell you, any change that we've seen in our church over the last several years, Carol Owens has been praying for all of us. If you felt the presence of God, it's not because I'm gifted or words. It has to do with her praying and the Spirit moving in this place. And we really believe that's a matter of prayer. And that's what we want to start today. It's not the end of that. But over the next several weeks, we want you to take time and pray about this. And then what we want to do is be moved by God and whatever He says then that's what we're going to do. So, Carol, would you come and close us in prayer? Would everybody stand with us? Father God, we are so grateful that you made us your children. Amen. And that as a child of God, as we sang this morning, that's who I am. I'm a child of God. One of my privileges as a child of God is hearing my Father's voice. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. Amen. And they hear me, and they follow me. Father, that's who we are. Lord, remind us of that as we fix our hearts and our minds on you this week and begin the process of asking you, Lord, to give us a vision of what you are doing in this place, God. We don't want to just hang on to what has been and what is comfortable, Lord. We want to be where you are doing what you are doing. And Father, you have heard our prayers for nine years in this building. We've had great experiences here. Some of us found a relationship with you in this building. Some of us came back to fellowship with you in this building. We have all been changed by hearing the word of the Lord and the presence of the Spirit in this building. But it's not the building. <laughs> the walls and the roof over our head are a convenience, God. But what made all of those changes, what changed our life completely was the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, the presence of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we don't want to stay camped out at this lovely oasis if the cloud is moving and you were taking us somewhere else. Yes, it means changes, possibly. It means getting out of our comfort zone 
And we are averse to that as human beings. We like things to stay the same. We like to get them all comfortable and arranged. And when you come and stir up our nest, it's uncomfortable for us. But God, more than anything, we want to be where you are and doing what you are doing. We have sought your face for nine years and said, Lord, bring in the one from the community. Show us how we can reach all of the people in this city that you have assigned us to bring into the kingdom of God. We don't want to miss that because we'd rather sit at our comfortable oasis. We want to hear from you, God, and I, for one, am committing that when I hear what you're doing, I will take action and follow you, Lord, even if it means I have to make changes and drive further or whatever it might be, Lord God. Take on responsibilities I don't have now. Give up responsibilities that I kind of enjoy and share them with other people, whatever it means, Lord, in all of our lives. More than anything, we want to hear your voice and follow where you're leading us, Lord God. So we seek your face this day, Lord, and we thank you that we can confidently expect to hear your spirit speaking to our spirit. We are your children, Lord, and you speak to us, and we thank you. And we ask you this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.